Now what you're looking at right here is a scrumptious piece of meat. This is a venison shoulder roast. We're gonna give you a recipe to cook this up. I say we, we have an old friend of Michigan Outdoors on the show, one of the originals who worked with Morton F for how long, Howard? Almost 16 years, Fred. 16 years, boy. Hope I'm on the air that long. This is Howard Shelley, classic wildlife photographer, and you're gonna have a couple classic wildlife films coming up. But you know, if we're gonna have this done by the end of the show, I gotta get it in the oven now. This recipe, I happen to know, is one of your favorites because it has horseradish in oh, it. Oh, I love it. What we do, this is a venison shoulder roast, which if this were a piece of beef, this would be sliced into chuck roasts. But of course, deer are so much smaller. This is what, oh, I'm gonna put that on last, that, uh, that onion soup mix. Let's see, we'll put some uh, stewed tomatoes on about a half a cup, maybe a little more than a half a cup, right there. On top of that, we're gonna put some horseradish on here. That's the thing. Uh, you know, a lot of people would think, all oh, that horseradish, it's about, oh, three or four tablespoons, it'd be hot, but it isn't. It cooks out, leaves a real good flavor. Now, there's the horseradish. Now we have about, oh, half a cup or so of red wine. I don't like to cook game with too much wine. Some people do, but I don't like to destroy the flavor. We're going to put a little salt on here. And some dry onion soup mix. Round on the top. We're going to add vegetables to this uh, in a while, Howard. I'll do that. First You're on the way show. to a great uh, dish right there, Fred. A little bit of water in here. Oh, I tell you. Where's my lid? That's how you fix this venison shoulder roast. Oops, great. Give you the ingredients again later. But we're going to be right back. Venison shoulder roast recipe. What do you have three films for us, Howard? Right. Wildlife classics from the days of Michigan Outdoors, the original Michigan Outdoors. We have a big buck, a pulp and young buck that a guy just got last week. Join me, Howard Shelley, in just a moment because it's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. From the rugged shore and woodlands of the north, it's history of copper mines and iron ore, the Great Lakes fisheries. To the farmlands of the southern counties we'll look around again at all that waits the sportsman in the state of Michigan. There's a lot of good hunting and, and fishing to be had late season here in Michigan. Here's a photo of Mike Bowers with a buck he got on December 14th. Now that's just not an ordinary buck. These antlers qualify for the Pope and Young record book. And that's quite an honor, Mike. Has certainly to, is. Has to score out at 125, Pope and right. Young? Right, minimums. How many people from Michigan have bucks in Pope and Young book? I don't know where offhand, but probably over 100 now. Mm hmm Well, that's significantly up from the past few years. Yes, it is. Because of an organization which Mike is an official scorer for, it's called Commemorative Bucks of Michigan. We mentioned this last week on the show, Buck Facts is a, a publication they put out. But here's a scoring form for commemorative bucks, and it's the same system for Pope and Young or Boone and Crockett. Now you'll see here, they measure one tine on one side of the antler, uh, check it out with the other side, and then record the difference. Now these tines on Mike's buck, there's very little difference between the length of the tines, only 3.2 inches, which are subtracted, and you can see here on the antlers, the symmetry is, uh, it's one of the most beautiful racks that you'll ever find. It's just magnificent. And you know, Fred, waiting 60 days uh, for the official measurement and everything, uh, I don't think the antlers will shrink, but very little, but it may lose an ounce or two in weight. Of course, weight doesn't make any difference for the scoring. A beautiful, symmetrical rack. That's what the Pope and Young and Boone and Crockett is, is all about. Was this a big deer, Mike? It was a nice deer, it weighed 150 pounds, but uh, not it wasn't huge. as big as it could have been, no, right. And not huge. Southern Michigan, you got it down around home? Right. Albion with a bow. Yes, sir. Great. You're a member of the Michigan Bow Hunters. You're uh, yes, I am. on I'm the a board. Governor. A governor? Mm hmm This is great. Good organization for people to join who are bow hunters. Get some experience from guys like uh, Mike, of course, Howard. Jeez, Howard uh, went bow hunting for the first time this year. You know how long it takes a first timer <laughs> to get a deer. How long did it take you, Howard? Just 10 minutes, Fred, the first time. <laughs> well, that's because Howard is a good hunter. You've taken many, many deers in your lifetime, many big bucks. But uh, you ever taken one this size, Howard? Yes, I have taken two larger than that, uh, two whitetails, uh, one mule tail, a mule deer from Colorado that's mm -hmm. much larger. But uh, anybody can be very, very proud of this. Oh, it's it's a magnificent thrill. specimen. Quite a thrill. You got it in the snow. The photo was in the snow. Was this yes. early morning or evening? No, it was about uh, 5 o'clock. I seen him about 10 minutes to 5, and uh, about 10 minutes later he worked in close enough to get a shot. He was in heavy brush, and I didn't think I was going to get a shot at him at all, but he finally mm -hmm. uh, kind of quartered to me, and I got yeah, a shot, and I hit him through the neck, and 
down through the chest and well, through his heart. Yeah, you've taken many deer in your lifetime, too, with a bow. That's I've taken a few, yes. How far did he travel? Uh, he went about 150 yards and laid down. Well, that's a, a great story, a great buck, a pulp and young buck, something that uh, we all can be proud of because we do have lots of trophy deer here in Michigan. Late season, late season bow hunters can do it too. You know, bass fishing, a lot of people would think bass fishing wraps up in September, the time hunting season starts. I want to show you our trophy report right now because I put out a challenge in September. Some fellas came on the show with two six-pounders. I said, I want you anglers out there to send in your photos and sign up for the master angler if you catch bass over five pounds smallmouth, six pounds for largemouth. And they sent the photos in and here's our trophy report. The first fall largemouth bass of this trophy report was caught by Bob Hull from Davison. He probably holds up that largemouth. It's nearly seven pounds. It hit on a spinner bait, the lake, Lake Nepissing in Lapeer County, 8.30 in the morning on October 3rd. But that's not the only master angler bass to come from that lake. Here's a largemouth, just one ounce less, six pounds, 13 ounces, also caught on a spinner bait. It was taken late morning on the 23rd of October, again, Lake Nepissing. The angler, Tom Sturgeon from Burton. That's two October bass over six pounds, both caught on spinner baits, so not everybody's in the woods with shotguns and bows. A little later in the afternoon on October 23rd, Brian Case of Jackson was trolling a crayfish deep diver in Leech Lake. That's down in Barry County. When a master angler-sized largemouth hit the lure, six pounds, three ounces, a trophy to be proud of. In fact, Brian's fishing buddy, whose name wasn't on the photo, at least wanted to be seen holding up the tail. Well, his friends know who he is. Those lakes around Flint seem to be mighty good for bass. This five pound, three ounce smallmouth came from another famous Flint area fishing hole, Holloway Reservoir, mid-September at 8 p.m. The magic lure, a Rapala. Louis Simony has a trophy I hope he had mounted. He's not gonna catch too many that size. Look at this, a bigger smallmouth by seven ounces that also went for a Rapala, Portage Lake in Livingston County. Caught by diehard bass angler Glenn Lusick from Dearborn on the last day of November at three in the afternoon. So you can't tell me that fall isn't a good time for trophy bass. You know, all of these master angler bass deserve special recognition. But I'm gonna close this trophy report with a different type of fish. You recognize it? It's a Menominee whitefish, three pounds, six ounces. It's a whopper for a Menominee. Clay Wilson from Muskegon caught it on a single salmon egg, undoubtedly off the pier at Grand Haven. You know, I'd like to have you anglers bring these more unusual species like this down on the show so we could look at them close up. So if you catch a master angler sized fish that, you know, isn't so popular, often regarded as a trophy, give me a call so you can come down on the show and be a Michigan Outdoors Trophy Angler of the Week. Of course, those trophy bass for the trophy report taken right down around here. Howard Lake, Nepissing, Holloway Reservoir. That seems to be a good part of the state for bass. Great. One of the best. Okay, you're familiar with that territory. I know you also, for many years, had a cabin up in this area, up around Atlanta. Right. That's one of the greatest parts of the state. Of course, you sold it this past year. Right. It might have been kind of tough for you. It did. Uh, it hurt me badly having to dispose of the cottage. Well, you have a film that you did up in this area. In fact, that right there is, I think, just about the headwaters of the Gilcrest Creek. A classic, a Michigan outdoors classic. Why don't you show us that film? Well, oh, I like to think of it in that manner. Uh, you know, being up north uh, in snow, a foot and a half deep, uh, Ruth and I searched and found the sign Gilcrest Creek along near the highway. And it dawned upon us what a tremendous adventure it would be if we could backtrack and follow that Gilchrist to its headwaters. So we spent hours that day, or two days, just following that meandering little stream, obviously uh, flowing downhill. And of course, uh, the objective being uh, stalk as quietly and slowly as you can through the cedar marshes, hoping to see a deer or a grouse, a fox, whatever it may be. But that flowing little stream uh, it gave us such a beautiful spot that we'd stop here and there, meander, take a good look at the surrounding hillsides and the little valleys below. Perhaps maybe that's where the stream flows by. And then just stop and take a look sky high at those huge towering pine trees. And invariably where one would find the pine trees, you'd see that beautiful white paper birch. And it made a tremendous contrast in the wintertime as one uh, meanders slowly along, just gathering in the sights of whatever one can see. But in the meantime, we were definitely 
searching for that headwaters of the Gilchrist. We followed the little creek through a cedar swamp, and across on the opposite shore, there, leisurely eating away, were deer right in midday. We were quiet. We didn't scare them. Then, continuing our, along the trail, we find rabbit tracks leading out into a brush pile, snowshoe tracks as well as cottontails. Another spot we found where a coyote had gone through the countryside that night. And then, ever so quiet, and when you're taking pictures of the movie camera, you must be just that quiet. Looky there, we catch mm. the fellow at bed, the red fox. And then, of course, he takes off. We continue our trail along that little stream, along the way. We find where man's tracks has invaded Mother Nature's countryside. And then as late afternoon approached, lo and behold, the grouse were budding, enjoying their afternoon meal. Off in the distance, we'd gather in the sight of whitetails that had already heard us. But then suddenly we come to a spot where the stream widens out just a little bit, comes back narrow again. Great cedar trees had fallen across, making an ideal hideaway for the brook trout in the stream. And then suddenly, right before our very eyes, emanating from the banks of a western hillside, there's the very object we've been searching for, the origin of that trout stream, boiling springs. And it goes just like that 365 days a year. The pressures from Mother Earth's bowels constantly are churning, tumbling, and one stands there and just looks in wonder because obviously there's a crevice in the rock way below where the pressure comes from, constantly turning, churning, never freezing over. It makes a sight quite delectable. Was that hot water, Howard? No, it's Couldn't not hot. Trout stream. It's it's very very cold, never freezes over. But mm -hmm. one can stand there by the hour and see something new. First the bubbles will come up from this angle, then move over in a foot or so from over there. We we'll even see a small brook trout coming into the area. Yes, it's uh, Mother Nature at its best. There's no dime store tinsel here, nothing artificial, no plastic. This is the handicraft of our maker in operation as we see it right there. So the objective of starting out, searching for the headwaters of the Gilchrist, we found it right there in Boiling Springs. So much pressure that when one pushes a stick down in the water like that, it will force it right back upward. So that is a Christmas gift to me. That was the real thing. Hmm. Filming and enjoying the hike while making the origin of a trout stream. Well, that's a great film, Howard. Michigan Outdoors classic. You know, the thing is, a lot of people, probably like myself, would walk along there looking for the trout stream and probably wouldn't see the wildlife that you see, let alone photograph it. That's very true. Uh, again, uh, I think the whole world, uh, whole thing back of it is uh, a motivating challenge to try and do it, and mm -hmm. do it. You know, that's amazing, though, because in your films on Michigan Outdoors, of course, we worked together back in the late 60s for a couple of years, both right. of us working for Morton F. But your films, when you cut those scenes in there, those aren't scenes from your library of grouse oh, no, and so no. on. That happened on that day right, when you right, were looking at it. Right. Amazing pictures. You have another story, which is, it just tickles me. It's so amazing uh, about a deer who came to dinner. Well, that's the title of it. Why don't we just go to the film here? Look. <laughs> we had a call from this Mr. and Mrs. Farmer, as I shall call them, over near Vermontville, just 25 or 30 miles west of here. Come on over, Mr. Shelley. Uh, we have something of interest for you. So I drove over, arriving well before daylight that morning, and there as Mr. Farmer went to the barn to milk, feed the cattle, wandering around the barnyard was this last spring's fawn. Hmm. Now, the deer was never tied up, never shut up, had free run of the countryside. It would follow the farmer around, and among all things that was strange, it made the perfect pet for their big boxer dog. Where you'd see one, invariably you would see the other. So I just made it my business that morning to try and have my camera at the right spot at the right time and see what would uh, happen in the way of a story. So was now, this you, raised as a fawn? 
it uh, just came in wandering from the woods one day, and from then on just stayed around the farm buildings. But uh, in the afternoon, it would go back to the woods. Next morning, it would return to the farmstead. Amazing. Now, Mr. Farmer goes to the granary. And when you see that young deer hop around right there, you know what's coming up. Mr. Farmer comes out with a half dozen years of choice kernel corn, and how the deer does love that. And that actually leads us into the title of our film, The Deer That Comes to Dinner. Because after he has his chores done, the farmer goes to the house. When the deer looks through the window like that, you better get the back door open because he's ready to come to breakfast. <laughs> And he comes moseying right into the house. And of course, the lady that supplies the food, he must go greet her first, because he knows that within a matter of minutes, uh, there'll be a choice food item for him. Now, you know, when our children come in the house, they have dirty shoes and dirty boots, but you never need worry about that in regards to our friendly deer. His feet are spick and span clean. Now, it's just about right. The bowl of dog food has been mixed, and there we see our two friends, friendly, never arguing. I want mine first. No, you can't have it. I'm going to have it next. No friendly. It's just good, plain, well, two pets together, eating and eating as you see them. And then as the next course, how about a slice of juicy apple and how that deer does love it? You'll note a little mar on its right eye. In its younger days, it got caught in a barbed wire fence. Then it moves into the living room in front of the mirror because you see this young doe, there won't be too long till she's interested in a young buck. So she wants to see that she's looking just right. And then finally, back to the kitchen. Well, here you see the big boxer, he's tired out already. He lies down for rest. Don't you hurt your buddy there with that sharp paw. Then the deer too will lie down momentarily, but only for three, four, five minutes, never going to sleep, always alert. And after it was there for less than five minutes, as one might suspect, it arises. And then, when it goes over to the kitchen window and looks toward the outside, that is it. You better get the front door open. She's ready to go outside. And that's the story of how our deer came to dinner. Howard, <laughs> that is nothing short of incredible. <laughs> incredible. I mean. Yeah, Marty Stover is a film producer uh, that has a Wild America series, and he uses animals that are trained. But a deer like that, that would be amazing to train a deer that much. Uh, there was no training whatsoever. There. Training. It was simply a case of that deer came in when it was a little spotted fawn, and uh, no one harmed it, no one hurt it. It uh, was uh, given food, and uh, literally it made its home right there. There aren't too many deer that have a personality like that, though. No, no, that's very, very, sure. very few wildlife species. In fact, oftentimes they get kind of mean and nasty when it comes to the fall. That's right. Well, that's that's right. Of course, you've seen ruffed grouse do this. Oh, yes, definitely. Occasionally. Uh, any other animal oddities that, uh, in your years of photographing, that uh, seem to tame down like that every now and then? Well, you named the one. Uh, in fact, on the show one time, we had a gentleman from rough from the uh, Mount Pleasant area that had a grouse came in and uh, it'd hop up on his hand, finally up on his arm, onto mm -hmm. his shoulder. And we called the old gentleman, had him on the show one night. Uh, I like myself, he was minus a lot of hair up there. Hey, and I the grouse, uh, the grouse stood right there <laughs> and pecked him so hard on top of the head that there were three or four blood spots there. You mean he brought that grouse into the right studio? Right in the studio, right down to the studio. And who knows why? Just, just so happens, one an unusual of, animal. One of the freak things of Mother Nature. Well, you worked for Martin F. for 16 years? 16 years. You've seen a lot of country. You've been around lecturing around Michigan for a, a long, long time. Come to communities and show films. Do you do that anymore? I had what I called my last picture show up at the village of KPAC last November 3rd to their mm -hmm. big deer hunters audience. Uh, a tremendous turnout, and I received a fine reception. And, uh, well, Fred, I'm getting along in the ears. Uh, the old voice isn't what it used to be, uh, not a sharp, resonant. You're and, as sharp uh, and resonant as I've ever known you. You haven't changed in 15 years, Howard. I like to think that, Fred. Well, I don't see any difference. I'm sure our audience doesn't either. Glad to have you back on, uh, back on the air. I wish this was the beginning of a, another Michigan Outdoors career for well, you. Well, how, how I wish it were. But you, 
where are you going now? In a couple of days, you're going to be leaving and go down to Texas? Yes, we, uh, Texas, uh, this will be our ninth winter going to Brownsville. Our trailer is already down there. We left it last spring, mm -hmm. and uh, we hope to spend the winter there, come back next April, and uh, start the wheel uh, rolling again here in this great old state of Michigan, and there's none greater. Oh, I know it. I know it, but you got to go with the weather in Florida. Right. You deserve a break during the winter, <laughs> believe me. Well, you have another little film for us here to wrap up our... Uh, Maybe not your last picture show. We'll keep our fingers crossed that maybe you'll save some films and come back again on Michigan Outdoors. But what's this one called? This one takes place, I think, around this area, our sharp-tailed grouse country? Right. There's very few sharp-tailed grouse left in Michigan. A few in the Upper Peninsula, mm -hmm. but in the Lower Peninsula, in an area 15, 20 miles northwest of Houghton Lake. That's uh, just about the only place. And uh, I went in there with one of the conservation officials a few years ago in the early in the spring to film this, and uh, again, it was one of those deals where, oh no, it can't be done. But I accepted the challenge. Moved my equipment in the day before, came in during the middle of the night and got in the blind, and as I was there, well hidden, and very quiet, at the break of day. Now the reason the sharp tails come to this particular area is because there's a special type of food that uh, grows there. Uh, you or I would call it just a a weed, but uh, I believe the proper term is it's called a sweet fern, and that's one of the reasons why the sharp tail will come into this area. So that morning, hardly with enough light, one single sharp tail flew in, landed on that old stump 30 feet away, and then another had come walking in, popped its head up over the top of the weeds, and then another, until I had 10 or 11 of them within 15 or 20 feet of my blind. Now, they were very alert and skeptical at first, but not for long, because now, well, daylight had gone by for 20 minutes, and for the next hour, you're going to see one of the most amazing displays of the dance of the Sharptails I think ever recorded on film. And strangely, it's the males that put on the dance, and more or less in a surrounding circle out around the edge will be the females watching possibly uh, thinking, uh, well, we'll make a selection as to who's the best dancer for a future mate. But the males will stand there, wings outspread, and then go into a dance. And you can see readily right there hmm. why they're called sharp-tailed grouse. And chances are, going back to the days of the Indians, that's where the name come from because they were very close to them, watched them, and gave them that name, sharp-tailed grouse. Now there's the close-up of the sweet fern that the grouse like eating so well and as to why they come back to the same area morning after morning from late March into early May. Now when you suddenly see a pair of the males approach each other, squat very low, spread out their wings, you'd think very seriously that there was going to be a real knockdown, drag-out fight here. But no, that's just part of the dance of the sharp tails. They'll slow up, look, and I'm sure the hens nearby are watching. Then they'll continue their act again, thinking that they're going to clobber the living daylights out of each other. And then in slow motion, look at those little tiny feet go rattity tatty tat 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 on Mother Earth as they're putting on that quaint, unique, different, unusual dance of the sharp tails. Finally, after just about an hour, the action ceases. Time to go. Some fly this way, some that way. But that's it. You've seen the dance of the sharp tails. <laughs> Howard, I tell you, the things that you've brought to audiences throughout the years on Michigan Outdoors, your 16 years working for Martin F., Absolutely amazing. People still could see that dance of the sharp tails, possibly, if they were really good naturalists and bird watchers. They've got to be in the right place at the right time, and of course I was lucky and that was working with the conservation department. Uh, they set up their blind and uh, uh, the weather was yeah. just right and conditions were just right. And 
that's the way it turned out. Well, that's terrific. Howard Shelley, that was great. We're going to get back in the kitchen here. And, of course, the sharp-tailed grouse, that's something that uh, you folks could do. Put that on your calendar for the spring. But Ed Groves, come on in here. We have a part of the show now. Of course, you know Ed. Right, yes, Howard? right. Sure, you two. Fabulous Matt. films. Ed's my producer. Well, uh, Ed, for our short-term calendar, what do we have coming up? Well, some events that we're definitely interested in. Let's find out what they are when we go to our outdoor calendar. Well, thanks, Ed. A lot of things coming up with the outdoor calendar, and of course on, on my little calendar here for this evening, I couldn't wait to get into this venison shoulder roast, Howard. Oh. Look at this. This was t this is from the spike horn that I got this year, second day of the season. Why don't you give that a taste? See if it's any good. You've eaten a lot of deer, Howard. I know you've eaten mm. a wild game of all types. Is that any good? You're a real first-class culinary oh. artist. Oh, well, thank you, Howard. That's a real compliment, because this guy's eating a lot of deer. But if you mm. would, would like to have this recipe, I'll, I'll run by what's in it. We have some dry onion soup mix, stewed tomatoes, uh, with some horseradish in there, a couple tablespoons. Put some vegetables around the outside, some little red wine. But that dish, with that horseradish in there, I think tastes great with a venison shoulder roast, or most any roast. You know, we're, we're gonna give you the ingredients, we're gonna give you the address, but I know a lot of you people out there might like to write to your old friend Howard Shelley, who you've seen for many, many years on Michigan Outdoors. You're gonna be where this winter, Howard? Well, we're going to spend the winter in Brownville, Texas. Okay, well, I'll tell you, if you folks would like the recipe that you just saw here, or Howard Shelley's address, be sure to write to us if you'd like to send a card to Howard Shelley, because I know he and Ruth would love to hear from you. Now for our weekend forecast for you ice anglers. Well, it's still kind of touch and go. There's snow and ice in a lot of places, and you really can't tell if it's safe or not. Rule of thumb, one inch, stay off. Two inches, you could go by yourself if you're careful. Three inches, go with a group, except stay in single file and stay apart. After three inches, it becomes a little more safe. In the UP, we're on Gladstone and Escanaba. They're catching uh, perch in the bay. They're also hitting pretty well off Caseville and some of the piers around Saginaw Bay. Steelhead are being caught in the stream. St. Joe is a real hot spot right now. Emil Dean reports the Grand River is still having steelhead as well as the northern steelhead streams here in the east bay of Traverse Bay. They are spearing whitefish through the ice. Otherwise, watch it. Be careful on the ice. It can be very dangerous at this time of year. Well. It's uh, the night before Christmas Eve, and we wish you all a very Merry Christmas. Next week, a special show. We're going to look back at 1982 with some very special guests. So join us for that, and at that time, we'll wish you a Happy New Year. Good night. Rugged shore and woodlands of the north, its history of copper mines and iron ore, the Great Lakes fisheries. To the farmlands of the southern counties, we'll look around again, and all that waits the sportsman in the state of Michigan.